I've worked for the Pathway team now for six years, um, and this morning's lecture is really interesting um, because you know we've seen uh, considerable changes in the options that are available to us and our patients when we're trying to afford them the best possible care. Um, one of the things that I've um, one of the things that I found actually over the last um, six years. And one of the reasons I reduced my clinical hours in order to focus on research is because I genuinely believe that being a clinical academic makes you better at what you do on a clinical basis. It gives you structure, it gives you robust, rigorous methodology to be able to do what you do well, to be able to evidence it and be able to show it. And one of the reasons I'm traveling around the country um, for this month is because I've published a number of papers in the field that have had really good uptake and impact um, when people talk about impact, don't think that that means a Lancet publication. It just means any publication that's important and relevant. And getting information out in the field makes a big, big difference to how we can care for patients overall. So this is about one of my papers, which uh, is about the role of the GP. There were lots of reasons why I did this um, publication. It's been on my mind for quite a while, and then somebody asked me to do it. So I said, yeah, all right, I'll do it. Um, we'll publish it. I was like, great, even better. And then I was applying for a PhD, and having publications on your application makes it a lot better. So there were lots of motivators to writing this. Um, but you know, we know from the recent publications done by Rob Aldridge and UCL that you know, we are living in times where we are seeing overlapping health needs. There's a lot of focus on homelessness, but actually what we know is that the population does overlap and intersect. Someone who's homeless, we, you know, they're on the streets at that time, but they might end up in prison, in which case they're a prisoner, they might end up in addiction services, and then they're an addict. But actually, these are often the same people moving in and out of different states. Um, we know about the mortality and morbidity. We've talked about that this morning. Um, and we know that there are a range of people who are homeless, and certainly the services that I see, rough sleepers make up about half of the population. And the rest actually are everything else. People being evicted, people in temporary accommodation, people sofa surfing, um, and also lots and lots of migrants without any recourse to public funds. Um, and we do need to keep an eye out on these sort of varying statistics that are slightly problematic when we're trying to give a true picture of the extent of the problem. And we all know about these sort of complex overlapping health needs in the context of wider social issues. So let's talk about inclusion health. So we now have some academic definitions of inclusion health, which really helps us. Uh, this was uh, Serena's definition, which we've adapted slightly. Um, but the key thing is that it's a social justice movement. It involves not only those people who are experts by practitioning, but also experts by experience, working with our full network to really redress and address the harms of inequity. And who are inclusion health groups? Well, that's a little bit more controversial. So if you look at the academic context in terms of the major studies, there are four key groups that are highlighted. However, we know that this group extends to lots of other people, including people experiencing domestic violence, people who've been trafficked, and others. So we are living in times of difficulty and change. I have to say that even though the, the government is saying that lots has been done and there's been a big impact, I'm kind of struggling to see that a little bit on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so I think that there is a kind of need at the moment to really think about equity versus equality and giving the right care to the right people at the right time. So the methodology for this particular paper, I did a detailed literature review of the role of GPs working in inclusion health, and that was across all the groups, the four main groups at least, but also migrants, refugees, and um, gypsies and travelers. Um, we gathered personal experiences, we did some structured interviews, um, and we also looked at some data from our own teams in South London. So the setting of this was really focused around pathway, but also thinking more broadly. Um, as you know, the work that we do in inclusion health, not just in pathway, but more broadly, is really about redressing inequity and thinking about um, what the models of care look like and thinking about that diversity of, of models of care and how we're sort of breaking boundaries by including housing workers, um, care navigators, and the voluntary sector within what we do. So really working across sectors, so horizontally and vertically through organizations, in and out of hospitals, um, across the primary, secondary interfaces. Oh, sorry. So I put two slides in there that were the same. So what the literature review showed is that um, it recognised that, uh, that uh, the health impact of exclusion is, um, is complex um, and that there are an, a number of contacts that most people will have with services. 
But what tends to happen is that those contacts often deal with just one problem. Oh, you fractured your arm. Okay, let's deal with the fracture, but we won't actually talk about the fact that we're discharging into the streets or what we can do about that. And what those ineffective contacts mean is that the wider needs aren't addressed, and that continues to sort of drive the poor health outcomes. So that's what the evidence and research tells us. There's very low uptake of pre preventative services and of primary care services, and that's because of considerable barriers in accessing those services. And that was across a range of literature internationally. Those themes had come up again and again and again. So GPs in pathway teams are based on that sort of Boston model. And it was really interesting hearing Jim talking earlier because he was talking about doing home visits as a consultant. And I was like, that's what I do all the time. So it's sort of like we're doing what consultants do by going into hospital and they're doing what we do as GPs by going out and doing, doing home visits. Um, the role of the GP in, in inclusion health, the role of the healthcare staff is actually quite broad and quite varied. Um, but it does coincide with the sort of diversity that we're seeing emerging in the role of GPs um, in terms of GPs with enhanced roles. They may be doing ENT or urology, neurology, urgent care, intermediate care. Um, and one of the interesting things is that GPs and pathway teams are often employed by trusts. Many of them are working in practices. And then there are other models which have transitional arrangements included. Um, so one of the key problems that came up through the literature was around training and education, which is my research interest around educating a range of staff in inclusion health to help them and enable them to care better for patients. Um, and this was obviously something that was lacking because there isn't really clear formal education in inclusion health. Um, Organising education in the field, what that might look like, accredited programmes, what CPD to do. Um, and a couple of years ago, well, actually probably more than that, more like five years ago, four or five years ago, I presented um, the top slide at this conference, um, which was really a reactive um, presentation. As an educationalist, I came into Pathway and thought, wow, I've got a lot to learn. Let me try and structure this in a way that makes sense. And it wasn't coming from a research perspective. It was coming from, a, in order to do my job, I need to know the following. And that sort of drove me to think about well, what are the basic minimum content in terms of CPD. That has now grown. In fact, we're now doing a CPD mapping exercise, um, looking at frameworks of competence. My entire PhD is based on education of healthcare staff. Um, and then looking at the, the experiences of the GPs coming into the roles, um, they come from a range of backgrounds, but some of the key things was some experience in inner city medicine, um, working with people who are mul multiply excluded, having had some previous leadership roles, perhaps having had international roles or research roles in the past, and often they were linked to a university. So what do we do? Well, we do a range of different tasks. And in fact, I would say a lot of those tasks are quite common amongst the clinical staff and the team. They do kind of um, a bit like our patients. They overlap and, and intersect quite co considerably. But one of the key things that I think we do do, do as teams and as clinical staff is really challenge culture, um, challenge negative attitudes, and really try to promote a positive and inclusive approach to healthcare. Um, Sam Dorney Smith, our nurse fellow at Pathway, had done some interviews um, with the GPs and with all the staff, with a number of the staff, not all the staff, within within quite a few of the Pathway teams. Um, and what was interesting about about this is that it it showed that um, patients do need a very high level of clinical care and input. That the challenge of complex and difficult negotiations with senior consultants is is not easy, um, and that there are these kind of difficult hierarchies to navigate through. Um, but importantly, um, one of the things that GPs didn't convey was was protectionism. We actually really valued, all of us who were interviewed um, were, va were valuing the role of the interprofessional team and how important that is in the care of patients. Some of the difficulties that were highlighted is that because it's a, it's a medical role, um, it is often considered very expensive, although I personally would say that I think it's quite good value, um, that it's often under session, leaving the teams without um, senior clinical input um, on most days of the week. Um, that we are quite fragmented as inclusion health GPs and even talking to people today on the education stand, there is a still a nuance of, of feeling isolated at times and not feeling as though 
you've got all the resources and support at hand. It is quite, it is quite a unique role being an inclusion health GP. Um, as I mentioned, questions about cost, and re more recently we've had some very troubling issues around people's appraisals and revalidation where people have been put at risk of being removed from performance lists or, or you know, risk of not being revalidated or having their roles curtailed. Now, I'm, a, I'm an appraiser, so this has sort of rightly fallen to me to deal with because I'm, I'm so angered and upset by the fact that these are some of the most skilled doctors in the country being put, put, put through this because of lack of, a bit like our patients being excluded and marginalised, you know, as staff, I kind of feel like we're being excluded, marginalised and disadvantaged and it absolutely cannot continue. So that's my kind of next mission is to make sure that we're recognised. Now, the HAAR study is one that I really do want to talk about. So this was an NIHR study, so a big national research study looking at primary care services for people who are homeless only. But if we were to include, say, refugee and gypsy and traveller services, I suspect we'd still struggle to reach 150. It's a relatively small number. And that included a range of services, so not just GP practices, but also mainstream practices with enhanced care, usually flexible access and approaches to care. Um, and also uh, GPs in reaching, so pathway teams, and people going out onto the streets, so, so outreach services on, uh, out and about in communities. Um, what they found was quite interesting. They found that most services were concentrated in inner city urban areas. And when they surveyed hostels and day centres, a lot of surveys, 900, so a big study, um, they found that even in areas with specialist services, over half still weren't linked directly to those specialist services. And where they didn't have any um, specialist services, where they relied on mainstream services, two thirds of clients had difficulty accessing mainstream care. Now, this is really important to me because it really has, in a way, reinforced my feeling that we in inclusion health do a very important job, but we can't do it alone. And we must upskill the whole profession to really work better and to care for everybody in their community and to build equity into their services. Um, where there are mainstream practices, I'm doing increasingly increasing work to really encourage them to think about uh, the different people in the community and how they can outreach to them. So if a refuge is suddenly created locally, a mainstream practice should be outreaching to them and saying, look, we will register you, we'll support you around your needs, or so on and so forth. So um, in conclusion, I think, you know, I mean, we all know that our jobs and our roles have really evolved. I think we should be proud of the fact that we have sustained our services during very, very difficult times of deep austerity, welfare cuts, chronic underfunding of public services. I think we've done well to not only sustain ourselves, keep our services going, and for some of them to get recurring long-term funding, which is the sort of, it feels like it's the pinnacle, although it should be the norm. Um, I think that it's important that we really look at how uh, we measure what we do. Um, tomorrow I'm giving a talk on the service evaluation from the Pathway team that I run at, at South London Morsey at SLAM. Um, but really thinking about the value and the quality of care that people are given, thinking about adding in interviews and qualitative work within what we do to really showcase um, and identify what we can do better, but also what we're doing well. Um, really focusing on interventions that are meaningful. There is a sort of ongoing focus on bed days, length of stay, cost saving, um, but actually those are largely meaningless because although you may save some bed days, actually by integrating somebody into a community setting where they are safe, where they're looked after, where they're supported, where they're accessing scheduled care also costs money. It's just that it's money that's spent well. Um, I did some deep dive service user work for preparation for my PhD um, and um, one of the things that a Groundswell peer advocate said is um, you're going to spend the money anyway, you can either spend it well or you can spend it badly, the choice is up to you, which I think really says it all. Um, I do think that we need to think about mandatory training um, of all staff um, and I think the Homelessness Reduction Act gives us an opportunity to do that. Uh, we do need to think about accreditation in terms of what are the basic minimum standards and skills that we need to have and what could that look like, what does that look like in terms of an educational offering. Um, and, um, and maybe we need to think about working a bit better together as GPs, we're all so busy, we're all so inundated. but. I don't know, maybe there's a chance that we can have a bit of time to just think about what are our JDs? What do we do? What, how can we quantify, qualify that in some way that, that makes sense for everyone and then maybe adding in specialist bits depending on your community? Um, and really thinking about our role as, as inclusion health 
um, doctors, nurses, and how we can improve mainstream care to support um, in areas which don't have specialist services. Um, so, um, <laughs> uh, so this is uh, some, some phrases from one of my favorite people in all the world, Alex Tullock, who is an academic that works at SLAM and who co-led the evaluation that we did at SLAM. Uh, whenever you're running a service, think about what's your hypothesis. He walked into the room and said that, and we all just looked blankly at him. What is it you really want your service to do and deliver? What is your, your, your main objective? Um, and be upfront about, be upfront about that. Um, uh, as I said, we are focusing a lot on, on, on efficiency, but actually, I disagree with that. Um, and Alex said it in, in this sentence, um, basing a program of work on its ability to make or save money is the wrong premise. Healthcare costs money, and good healthcare costs even more money. And finally, um, when you're looking at services around you and looking at ways of developing the care that you give, um, the, third, the third key phrase from Alex is you cannot directly replicate a service between two different organizations, no matter how similar you believe they are. And that's a really important thing to remember is every community is a little bit different. Really think about what your community needs. Look at what works, but adapt it for what you need. Now, I'm not saying that you should do pilots necessarily. If something works, it works, but just think about adapting it for your service. We are running a master's course at UCL um, in inclusion health. It's open to everyone. Um, so please think about registering and coming along. We're offering free places to experts by experience. They need to apply with a, um, a short 300 words on why they want a place. So, so please encourage any experts by experience or service users to come along. Um, it's running from April until June. Um, and lots of people here are lecturing on it or part of the panel discussions. Um, and finally, this is, um, this, I always love putting this slide up at the end, and I put it up because it reminds me that we can't do it alone, and that, um, and that working together actually is our strength and something that we should be really proud of, because in Inclusion Health, we really do emulate um, the fact of, that we work in an integrated way across many, many different organizations. That's it. <laughs>